What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Listen In with Lily Invest podcast, where I use my opportunity to talk to successful real estate investors to create a conversation that you can use to listen in and benefit from in your own real estate investing journey. Today, we are talking to Joe Edgar, who is another real estate investor and software company CEO with Tenant Cloud. And if you haven't heard of Tenant Cloud, they're actually also the sponsor of this episode. They are what makes property management for me super easy and super affordable. Most times, property managers are going to charge 10 to 15 percent of the rental amount in order to manage your tenants for you tenant cloud makes it so that you don't have to hire a professional property manager but you also don't have to take phone calls in the middle of the night to unclog toilets for your tenants i talked to joe not only about tenant cloud and getting you guys a link below that you can use to try it out but also about his real estate investing journey the different types of investings that he's done and how it all started long before he was able to even legally drive i got a ton out of this episode and i know you will too So before we get started, don't forget to change the color of the like button if you're watching this on YouTube or rate it five stars if you're listening to it on your favorite podcast app. And let's get started. Yeah. Why don't we just kind of start there? Do you invest in Austin? Is that where you have your properties? And how did you get into this whole real estate? Um, uh, No, myself. I mean, I started in Oregon. I grew up in Southern Oregon, Chilliquin. I bought my first one. I was around 14 and uh, fixed it up. Lived on a reservation, uh, Chilliquin. And fixed it up. I think I spent, you know, maybe 60 days working on it and then flipped it and then they bought more and then more. And now that turned into thousands of properties all over the West Coast. And and then I do have a bunch of them in Austin as well. But, uh, but yeah, now they're all over the place. So. so let's go back to that first one. Did you say you were 14 years old? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, so what's like, what's the story of that? I mean, most 14 year olds, I know myself at 14 was not thinking about state, let alone taking any type of action like how did you manage that uh i mean well technically i couldn't own the property but i grew up uh, one of 13 so we're a large family and we're pretty poor so it's pretty much the community so this will be hard to believe if i put it in numbers sake but the first property i ever bought was ten thousand dollars <laughs> On the reservation, I only had $3,000 that I'd saved up on lawns. I put that as a down payment and agreed to make my next payment in 60 days. So I had 60 days to fix it up. But but I'd grown up, uh, my father swung a hammer and my mother was a janitor. So we were the labor force. So we already knew how to do a lot of it. So, so yeah, I closed on it and borrowed as much as I could from the local hardware store and fix it up and then had it sold within that 60 days by the time I was, I mean, literally I, I remember staying up late, late nights trying to finish it right before they moved in to get it all to work out. But, uh, but yeah, so that's just, Did like one of your parents or something sign for you on the actual yeah, loan? Yeah, my parents had to sign on the loan. So they did a lot of them where they had to sign for me until I turned 18 and then I did a bunch of them from there. How so. many, how many would you say you did prior to being 18? Like just making it happen? Uh, I don't know. There's probably 10 to 15 of them in that time period. So then it was uh, a little different because it was I'd buy true fixer uppers like older houses that needed a lot of work. So, I mean, it was a lot and I was young, so I could. But I mean, I bought many homes without foundations. Wow. (laughs) And so I would personally have to get out and dig out underneath and pull all the soil out and get it out and jack it up and lifting so i lifted lots of homes from there i sort of got a little more savvy as i learned about the tax structure and so um, as soon as you get into real estate the first thing you're gonna learn is capital gains and how it impacts you so in playing with capital gains um i said man it's a lot of work and there's a lot of people who are trying to do what i'm doing uh, that would like to get into it but aren't quite there so then i started carrying more notes so i'd buy a house i still find fixed uppers but i wouldn't do the work Right. I would sell it immediately and I would try to sell it on as much of a, a note as I could. So I'd put a small amount down and I'd require that amount down, um, but I would change the term slightly. <laughs> and so uh, oftentimes I would sell them for less than I bought them, believe it or not. Really? Uh, that allowed me to take a small capital loss. Uh, but over time, if you change the term slightly, you know, a 10 year note, has a pretty big disparity between it as uh, those interest rates and terms are different. So wow. I'd always make sure they're longer and a little higher. Um, but I was essentially being the in-between bank. So that was a fair assessment to help everybody win. And then, I mean, later on in life, it was 10 to 15 years. The 
you know, I really learned how smart that was. <laughs> I think at the end, it was just a numbers game. Like, this is great, but you don't really see yourself 10, 15 years in the future. And then when you do all those notes that I had just started buying and selling those by the masses, uh, you know, each one of those were 15 to $50,000 in difference, you know, over the next 10 to 15 years. So, so when interest rates, uh, when interest rates went uh, really, uh, well, comparatively lower, and there were lots of sales and refinancing going on in like 2002 to 2005, a lot of people just started refinancing and paying those off. And that's when I was like, right. you know, they weren't, they weren't, you know, 20 to $50 checks a month. All of a sudden it was, you know, 20 to $50,000. So, so, so let yeah. me break this down a little bit, make sure I understand what you're saying. Cause the one thing about it, it sounds like a, a brilliant idea. So you would get a fixer upper and you would, would you pay for it in cash from the bank or you would get a loan from the bank? Same Neither. Time? Neither. Now this isn't so common now because our market's flush with cash. So sure. it's harder for you to do, Sure. Uh, but it, they're still out there. Um, but definitely this is, you know, the mid nineties mm -hmm. and during that time, uh, you know, cash wasn't so ubiquitous as it is right now. And a lot of people would basically do what they call carry a note. And so what you do is you approach someone who has an old house and, um, you know, it's maybe not, most of the time these were not on the market. They weren't trying to sell. Mm -hmm. And so what I would do is I would say, okay, well, I'll come in with a down payment. And so let's say, and, and in those days, I, uh, that's all I really could do. So most of them were between two and $5,000 in down payments. I really didn't put much more in there until later. Uh, but I'd be, I do two to $5,000 in the down payment. I said, okay, then how about you carry this note and I will make a payment to you every month. Uh, that means I cover all the property taxes. I got to cover the insurance. I got to maintain the property. And if I never pay you, you get your property back. And so I'd make sure to sell them all the benefits of selling this property is that you don't have to pay a huge capital gain now. You just have to pay it on um, down payment and then on the payments from thereafter. And so it is a nice thing. So a lot of people who just had a house that was sitting on the side, right. like, oh, this is kind of a nice revenue stream. This is better than rent because, you know, you know, it'll give me a 20 year note and I don't have to take care of the property. And so if right. you really pitch it that way, they're becoming your bank, right? And then you can work with any title company. These are called wrap, wrap arounds, sure. uh, no carries. There's lots of names for these. They're all the same thing. Right. And your title company will bundle these all up for you nice and easy. And so you have a payment that is going to that owner. And then as soon as you do that, you're going to take that paper. So now you own the house, but you also have a note that you owe someone. Yep. And then you immediately sell it to somebody else with very similar terms, but a little more advantageous. Yep. And then you take to the title company and they will put those together. And so when the person you sold the house to makes the payment to the title company and the title company will charge five to $10 a month for putting together all the payments, then they will immediately pay the net difference to the person you borrowed the money from and then send you your net cut. So it bundles, it makes it really easy. And again, I have now passed on the liability, the same thing I offered to the, the seller I don't have to pay property taxes. I don't have to do the upkeep. I don't have to do anything. Right. I am, however, liable for the payments in between if there are issues. And so that's right. really where you have to know the business that you're getting into is that, you know, you are a debt collector now. <laughs> and so right. you do have, like, if they don't pay theirs, all of a sudden it builds up really fast. And so right. balancing that is an effort. So I took that in the original ones. I just did those constantly. And then I started to advance that a little bit and I started to take and say, I mean, cause there was a little more capital available to me. So this was, you know, I guess 18, 19. Um, and I had taken a stint, I did a mission in Australia. So it was right before that and sort of during, but I would take and buy these houses and then I would also offer a little money to it. And so, so long as that money went into fixing up the house, then I would actually offer a, a little additional loan to, kind of fix it up and that was pretty nice too because most of these houses are people who you know they couldn't by any terms of a conventional bank they couldn't get a loan right and so but for me i'm like oh you know what i i really can can do this to anyone and so i did loan to lots of people that definitely would not get a conventional loan uh but they're hard-working people and that's all you really need it's like well if you want to fix up a house and make something great for yourself then I mean, that's really the target. And, and it's sad because a lot of that market doesn't exist anymore because cash took over. 
And so when 2000, it really started in 2002 and ended in 2008. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was that 2005 peak where there's just so much money out there that, you know, to carry a note was just ridiculous because like, well, here's cash. Cash right. was everywhere. So all of a sudden no one really thought about, you know, can I get, you know, cash flow? They were like, oh, here's a huge chunk of cash. And so, right. so that changed a lot of things. And I don't think it's ever corrected, you know, so. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is this is something that I've been talking uh, kind of with my team about is kind of doing like these owner finance wraps, right? Where, you know, there's, especially in my, in my market, you know, I'm in, in the Oklahoma market, things are slowing down. There's property sitting on the MLS for months, off market, people can't or don't want to sell uh, for whatever reason, but are much more open to maybe some creative financing options, like you said, it's like owner carrying the note. Um, and one of the reasons that I really want to talk to you about why I'm interested in that is because going from being a debt collector or going from being a landlord to now being a debt collector, being responsible for maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, being responsible for getting those payments done. What was your experience like? Do you have a preference between those two <laughs> ways of investing? Uh, I hate them all, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, but there's a balance. I mean, eventually. Before I moved to Austin, Texas, and I did my undergrad at University of Oregon, as I mentioned, and I did a research paper on what real estate market would hold their value most, which ended up bringing me to Austin, Texas. Mm, okay. <laughs> and uh, and of course, it did end up holding its value through 2008, and it's done something. I don't understand it right now. Right now, it's a world of I don't understand it, the current situation. But in 2008, it was uh, more changeable because you couldn't get a uh, HELOC on a house or a home equity loan on a, on a house in Texas. And so it's very hard. So unlike the rest of the country we did, but Oklahoma is a great market, especially if you find some of those unique areas, it's, it's really the pitch. The hard thing about doing a wrap is that to find a seller and to explain this to them, there's now like two decades of it not existing. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and so you have to go through the explanation and education, which is unfortunate. Um, cause it is such a, a great way to do things because you are helping people get cash flow. And so sadly, a lot of the older retiring people, um, if it's not a rentable home, mm -hmm. then, uh, they're left with the idea that reverse mortgages are their only alternative. <laughs> That's not the case. Right. And so, and you know, of course they're not homes they're living, so it doesn't really match up anyways, but so yeah, it does create a, I don't, I don't know if the answer your question, I sort of lost it, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, it does make a, a great market. Do you, do you find though that you prefer being the note holder versus being the oh, landlord right. yes. and dealing with the tenants? Uh, so, so by 2005, I ended up with really three companies. Uh, one of them did, we would just buy homes and fix them up. So we're doing rehabs because by 2003, like, uh, we were doing this, but by the time I'd buy it, someone would offer me like $20,000 more in cash. I'd be like, what is going on? So prices were going up so fast that we stopped selling anything. And that's really where it turned into back to rentals. Mm -hmm. and, well, that's actually the start of the heavier rental side. So it turned into a rental business as we were just building up inventory. Um, and then we were developing land. So we're buying land because you could still buy the land at reasonable prices. And if you developed it, then you could get a lot for reasonable price unless, whereas if you went out in the market and you were to buy a new buildable lot, it was going up. And so we just started doing our own. And so we started turning those all into rentals because right. the prices were just going up so much. So we'd build little single family home neighborhoods. Uh, first we were doing like, you know, we turn one property that had, you know, enough for three homes on it. We turn it into three homes and then we got into doing more where it was like whole neighborhoods. So we had that one going. So between the three, we ended up with property management, we ended up with development of land and then new construction. And so, and then of course on the side, there was lending and that ended up morphing, to be honest, um, that we were doing so many loans and the loans were really interesting that I ended up stepping outside of the real estate realm. Unfortunately, my first one was on a bean farm, which was not the best thing. <laughs> <Okay. know. laughs> Losing out on that. But it uh, exposed me to what, you know, now is a very common term, but um, then it was, it was definitely new to me, but equity financing and venture capital. 
angel investing. I didn't know anything about it at the time. At the time I was, you know, I was offered equity in a business and I said, oh no, I'd much rather do loans. I'm a, I'm a lender. That's how I work. You know, I like the loans. And I was familiar with them. I'd now I knew a lot about putting together a loan and securing it as collateral. So sure. we did lots of those. And then when a particular business did really well, I was a little bummed that all I got back that was you didn't my have equity. principal <laughs> and my interest. And I was like, man, that is a bad deal. So that was my first entrance into like, okay, you know, to get equity, it does take risk because now you don't really have collateral. And there is a whole difference because in a co corporate structure, all owners are in second position to any loan. <laughs> <laughs> gets the first one but on the upside the loan just gets what it's entitled to and so that's right. why it's laid out that way and so uh from there i you know went into a whole different direction that and then i you know did lots of angel investing and then ended up being heavy into the venture capital world and then getting into tech and so in fact tenant cloud which is the company i started about seven years ago and it's grown and it basically helps landlords do just like I was talking to you. It's really more on the landlord side, but it really helps you run your investment. But it all started kind of from just having those very struggles in those three different departments of like, you know, there's not a lot of software. There's not a lot of know-how for the DIY, but I didn't realize how big the DIY market was. Right, right. So when I landed on it, I didn't realize it's 70% of all the rent transactions in the country. It's right. gigantic. So. And so you see this opportunity, you have some insights on how to do this. You see that there's a lot of people who don't know how to do it, but did you have a tech background to start this tech company or did you just put the pieces in place, you know, with someone who did? Yeah, I don't want to mislead. I'm going to say yes and no, but so uh, I, I did do some programming and I did okay. create an original website when I was in Oregon called ferrant.com that we ended up shutting down as we moved to property management. So I did play in tech, but that is not how I grew the company. <laughs> so I later got into venture capital, went to Texas, and I realized like I'm much better on the business side than I am on the tech side. And so in putting together Tenet Cloud, I didn't code any of it. <laughs> and so I'd say, you know, that's why I say really no, I wasn't on the tech savvy. I did have a vision of what we wanted to build. And mm -hmm. so it's really a matter of putting together like-minded people who can see that same vision. And, you know, just making sure that vision is talked about every week. And so we right. have what we call epic meetings. And we still have them to this day. And it's just pitching the same vision. Because if you have a lot of people, the first thing, each one will see it slightly different. And the less times you come back to reality, then it starts to be like this. So it's repitching that same vision over and over and over. But, you know, eventually we, we came out with 10 o'clock. So we... We started with a team uh, in, in fact, a lot of our team is in Ukraine. Wow. So we built out a huge, uh, very large team in there. And so I talk to them almost every day and there's, you know, they're going through what they are now, but uh, it's been a fantastic group. So we have people all over the country. So why did you choose the Ukraine? Uh, it sort of landed on me. I didn't really choose it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the start of the story is that I went, when I had this idea for 10 o'clock, um, it wasn't by name yet, uh, but there was no DIY software. There was nothing out there. There's building a map folio, and that's about as low as you could get. And there's nothing for, you know, us DIYers. Right. And so in trying to build it, I approached three different companies coming from an angel investor. I had years in that. I was like, well, I know how to do it from this side. So what if I approach you all? You're not doing very well. So what if I bring in money and I'll give you like what I think this market should do and change this business. So one of the companies was in Oregon, which I was excited about. I'm from Oregon. And uh, that founder was very pompous and it didn't work out. They later raised some money and had a very successful exit at a co-star. So okay. they did okay. I also went to one in Florida and that did not work out. They had already at least basically gave up and shut down. And the third one that was kind of getting a start was in Chicago. And um, these were two uh, Ukrainian immigrants that had kind of put together this company with a real estate developer out of Chicago. And they had give, given it a go for maybe two to three years and it was uh, on the struggling ropes. And so it was perfect time. So uh, we just saw like-minded from there. And so originally they, they had a team uh, in Ukraine that they were kind of helping do in development. I said, well, we're gonna shut all that down, move it all to Austin and change the name, we're gonna change everything about it. <laughs> so uh, we started to do all of that. 
and our developers here, our senior developers here were, you know, basically being taught from our junior developers there that my mind was just blown, like what's going on over there? So hopped on a plane, went and met them all. And I cannot believe the tech market that is in Ukraine. Wow. So, so from there we grew both and we've made a couple of acquisitions since then. So it's been, it's been a good run, uh, to the cloud. So, so now we process, you know, a couple of billion dollars in rent every year. And yeah. I just got all mine two days ago or something like that. <laughs> nice. Nice. It's always nice when tenants pay rent. So. Absolutely. You mentioned one. the vision and these epic meetings that you have where you continuously pitch the vision. What, what is that for tenant cloud? Yeah. So originally, um, you know, Tenant Cloud was a place for the DIY landlord to connect with service professionals, tenants, and an owner. And so we continue to maintain that as the vision is that really it's a, a software that helps you um, just make decisions. And so in my business, one of the hardest things was, you know, sure there was Excel, but if you want to write a program in Excel, well, you got to go and input everything. Right. And then you have to go find a service professional. Then you got to schedule it. And there's just so much tedious work that doesn't really need to be there. So by us, including four personas, we have a tenant, um, we have a service professional, owner if you're a property manager, and that's been kind of our evolution as we've stepped in to help uh, smaller property managers in the space as well. Mm -hmm. um, but by creating all them and then having their natural interactions already built in the software. So, hey, I need a lease. I need to move them, okay send them a lease and they fill it out, they sign it, they're done and all the information a lease automatically sets up the accounting and the accounting's done and the landlord didn't have to do anything. It's automatically gonna invoice them for late fees based on whatever you set it to. Those are parts that normally used to take a lot of work. Now it's just automated. And then having that flow right to your bank account. And then if they submit a maintenance request, something breaks, immediately having the ability to get a bid from a local service professional. See so like, all right, well, do I wanna do it? Is there someone out there? You know who can do it i mean those are the kind of things that diy landlords you know almost all of them are professionals that's something other than being a landlord right. <laughs> and so For helping sure. them be decision makers you know on the fly is really you know the need that's out there and so that continues to be our goal just to making life you know, easier for landlords and making that smoother. So, so we hope to bring in uh, more tools as far as service professionals go. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of stuff going to be coming down the pipeline um, in that regard. We have a lot more tools coming for leads. So right now, Tenant Cloud is the only product where if you turn on to list your property, you'll probably have 10 to 15 leads immediately. Mm. And so we built something in jargon terms, we call it tenant match, but you can mm -hmm. think of it like tender for tenants. <laughs> um, and basically what it is, we have all these tenants that come to us every month and they are either filling out an application to apply to a rental or they got rejected or they're just checking out something, you know? And so we had so many, we're like, well, what we can do is we can help them. And then we have all these landlords with all these properties who are trying to find a tenant. Sure. So here we have this huge network outside of everything else we were trying to build. We have this bottleneck of them finding each other. So we said, well, this actually helps out. We'll just have the tenants tell us what you're looking for, if you are looking for something. And then we can take all the inventory here and we can match these. And so what happens is when you list your property, any tenant who is looking for something in that area or meeting some something about that property's you know, general or specific needs will right. pop up in that property. And the landlord has the ability to now see like, oh man, I have 10 potential leads. I will invite them to apply. So they can go through and invite them to apply. They have a basic profile so they can read on it. You know, if it says, well, I have a dog or, you know, something like that, they can automatically say what's in or out. And then when they send those invites, all those tenants will get the invites. And if the tenant, you know, likes the property, they can swipe right. If they don't, they swipe left. And so if they swipe right, then they can ask for more information, get a tour, or even fill out an application right there. And so it's really a way to engage where landlords, can help define really who's looking for them faster by sending it to those when, it, when it's ready. And then right. tenants can have better decisions by saying, hey, not only can I do the old search, but I can actually get some invites about properties that are available for me. And we're soon to take that to a whole new level. And so we've been working a lot on some AI type uh, uh, products. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing, like if you look at everything in your life, 
recommendations have overtaken us, right? And even though it's annoying, like I'm afraid to say certain things around my phone, <laughs> isn't like then I'll start getting all these ads from them, right? For sure. But recommendations are so powerful because they're also nice because you're like,、oh, I did like the fact that I didn't have to go search or anything. Well, real estate is the last standing tower of search. If you go to anything in real estate, you are searching. Just searches everywhere. There's no recommendations, and so we've been really working on a tool to help. And one of those is based on image recognition.、Mm-hmm. And so,、um, if you're looking through, so in our one of our brands, Rentler, if you're looking on the Rentler app,、um, as you go through and just look at any picture, we'll take every photo and break it down into at least a hundred data points. Really, and then those can all be filtered back to you for recommendations. What type of data points would you be looking at? So, an example is: let's say you're looking at like you could do anything from a kitchen. You look at a kitchen and you say, "I see stainless steel fridge. I see, you know,、uh, marble top countertops. You know, something like that." You could say, "All right, well, what within my searches has stainless steel kitchens, or or、uh, what has marble countertops?" And so, from those, you can actually pull properties in that have all these settings, and then it's. It's to the point where images tell us so many things, and if you were to go down a normal questionnaire, not too many people fill it out because it is hard to go through a questionnaire.、Like, yes, yes, yes. But if I give you certain images, it turns out those are much easier to go through.、And、an example, right, is if I asked you, if I showed you a picture of a school and you liked the picture of a school, chances are you either have something to do with children or you have children. Mm-hmm. If you don't like a school, chances are you don't have anything to do with children, and you'd rather not live where there are a bunch of families or schools because it's just a pain because you got to go through all the traffic, right. right? And so then you're more interested in like, well, show me where there might be more restaurants or bars. And same thing with animals.、Uh, you can say, okay, well, if I like a dog park or don't like a dog park, means you do have an animal. It means you do want to go on walks. You do need things that are close. And so simple pictures like that can narrow down. A better place that you're looking to live than you may have thought. Right. And one of the thing that's there's this there's this falsehood out in real estate, and that falsehood is the fact that、uh, you know anyone who's ever I don't know if this is still a term. Unfortunately, I'm older. I, <laughs> it's a, but they have they used to have glamour shots. Ooh, is, I don't know about that one. <laughs> okay, all right. So glamour shots used to be the thing that men and women would do, and they would go and get like you know dressed up. It would be like there,、okay. you know, because you couldn't snap. There weren't selfies in that you know,、sure. that early days. <laughs> but uh, uh, but you were basically, you know, having an opportunity to take a picture of the year to like show yourself off, right? And so it's. I'm not going to say it was a falsehood, but if catfishing is a term, this is like、sure. you know, this is your time to catfish. Right, right. <laughs> so this happens every day in real estate. Real estate, the landlords go and take the best photos they can of their property, and most of them are not true. Right. <laughs> and tenants get so frustrated,、uh, and landlords get frustrated too when tenants drive up to the property and then drive away and don't actually do the showing because the tenant.、Yeah. But landlords the one who lied. They're the one who made this presentation like, "Oh, it's amazing. It's quiet," and they find it's right next to a train. The、right. thing is built on sand, you know. <laughs> And so、uh, that ability to kind of weed some of those out means tenants really need a place to truly in, engage themselves, and so that's what we're able to kind of bring to the table is kind of that balance, which in in turn actually helps the landlords. So landlords think it doesn't help them, but we now have data to prove that by actually getting to you, the tenant who has the most propensity to rent from you faster, right, means you have less vacancies. And over, trying to oversell with you know fake pictures and misleading、yeah. actually loses you rent.、Money. It hurts Because, in the long run. Exactly. So you waste so much time trying to deal with all the tenants that you lied to, and the tenants are so <laughs> frustrated. They waste the time because you did lie to them, and so by the time you get to someone, you've like brought the rent down to what it should have been in reality, and then you've now targeted tenants who you know. Who are okay with the train being in your backyard? Right. You know, we're like,、right. don't have kids that a train wouldn't bother them or something like that. And so,、right. so、are、that's really where. 
Yeah. Are there particular markets where you have more of those data points where, you know, someone who lives in New York City who's using tenant cloud to find tenants might get more matches than someone in a different market? Um, no, tenant cloud fortunately has them everywhere where I will say we are more heavy is that, you know, just by the nature of who our, you know, traditional user is, we're more about single family homes. We do have a lot of apartments, um, but we tend to be more about homes, uh, just because apartments in general. So the, the more, you know, uh, urban area you get downtown, then, you know, the less tenant cloud is going to be the your place. DIY. Yeah. <laughs> Just because you end up in these tall buildings and you're in apartments and they are all run by, you know, the big reach of the world. Managed, and so, yeah. so yeah. So once you get out, then that's really, it's even out into the country. And that's really where tenant cloud is going to be, you know, there. Now, as far as that tenant match function, we're starting, it'll be on the Rentler app, and we'll be moving that to some of our other apps. That's really where we're testing it. And so our first market is really testing out in Salt Lake and okay. that Provo area. Um, but slowly it's going to be advancing outside of there over 2023. So it'll be in, it'll, you'll see it in more and more places. But what's nice is we've, the way we've architected the software, um, you'll see it in tenant cloud uh, without knowing it right so it's actually the brainchild so as more and more things do you know it, it'll be popping up as a recommendation for you and so right so we hope you know it, it in 2000 towards the two, end of 2023 we really hope that everyone is able to really get uh, true recommendations around places that they would like to write and and really i mean it's it's a big problem to solve i know it sounds simple but to find like the place that you really want to live, it's not as easy as people think. And most people search by two things. The top number one is price, and the second one is geography. And unfortunately, you know, but that ends up not being the deciding factors. Right. <laughs> but that is what we always do with search. And so, so yeah, so I hope by the end of next year, we'll really see, you know, how powerful that is. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see some of those things. Um, like I've kind of shared with my audience, I've gone through the complete DIY, just having tenants pay me through Venmo and emailing them leases and trying out some other softwares and, and have landed on Tenant Cloud uh, for a couple oh, of months awesome. now. And, and you know, that's we're right. really happy with it. So appreciate that's you guys awesome. reaching out and giving us the chance to try it out. But like I said, we just got paid a couple of days ago was was the first. I love it. Yeah, so that's, it. Always, that's always a good sign. I'm that curious. As, as someone who has a lot of market data, right? Because you, you've got all these insights from all over the place. What is your thought on if, if what's coming? Like what's happening right now in the housing market? What's coming? Yes. If you're right, we will clip this up and we'll blast it to news outlets all over the world in six months. And if you're wrong, <laughs> nobody will remember. So just, right. just curious on your thoughts. <laughs> I love it. Well, I do write for Forbes. I've been going kind of through this last two years, kind of been putting my monthly um, op-ed piece out there quite a bit but mm -hmm. so this is very different than 2008 a lot of people make these 2008 comparisons and it's not a fair comparison in 2008 there wasn't nearly as much money out and so and that's even after i told you like in 90s when i was like there was no money but in 2008 mm -hmm. there was not nearly as much money that is in the market and so during covid um federal reserve flooded the market with cash and so all of that money still sits on the sidelines. And mm -hmm. so for it to even be comparison to 2008 would mean that, okay, we're going to raise interest rates and we're going to pull as much money out as we can. And so when people start to feel it is sadly when they lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. So even though the Fed has uh, two things they're trying to achieve and one of them is now employment, that's ultimately what they're trying to achieve here is unemployment. And by having people lose their jobs mean that they are now faced with, okay, well, I have this mortgage payment. Well, let's just say if that happened by large, and we're hearing all these tech companies laying off people, right? And so let's just say that that happens, that people come you know, to do that. Well, if you look on the sidelines of how much cash is in the market, well, that's only going to work because what happens if I'm faced in a situation where, let's say I lose my job, I have my house, I'm like, I got to pay my mortgage. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go to my savings. Of course, trying to find another job, but I'm going to go to my savings. Right. As soon as my savings depleted, I got to get a loan. Try to get a loan. Well, now I don't have a job. Yeah. So, uh, and the interest rates are going to be outrageous. Right. right. So that's not going to help me. So then the next thing I'm like, I got to sell this house. So mm -hmm. what actually makes the real estate prices fall? That is when I go to sell my house and it's in a hardship situation, 
and I lower the price of this lower than market because I need to sell it now. If that happens, well, then that's going to be happening everywhere, right? A lot of people are going to be facing that. But if there's so much money sitting on the sideline that I can sell my house at market and walk away with a chunk of cash, that's not 2008. Right. No need and for so the prices to drop. Prices won't drop. <laughs> Everybody's sitting on the side hoping, well, you went to Austin. It's a huge problem here because like, you know, the 15 years ago, a house two doors down sold for 268000 And it just went for $1.2 million. <laughs> you said how many years you know, ago? I thought, well, like a little for, over 15 years ago. For 268000 Wow. Yeah. So that just tells you Austin just went. And most right. of that was like in the last two years. And so right. it's not it's not fun because we pay a lot. We don't pay uh, income tax here, but we pay property tax. So that one sale just hurt our whole. I mean, like my property tax just tripled, right? Yeah. So um, if you see kind of that, you're not going to see the same type of impact. They're already trying to bring unemployment. And so at our national unemployment right now is at 3.5%, historically low. And yet you hear all these tech companies doing layoffs. Right. Really, they're just taking advantage of what market it is and trying to do a little house cleaning. Right. And so um, you're not going to see much changes in real estate. <laughs> the new adaptation is that you know prices are probably going to go up more. Not not nearly as fast, but the reality is, if you look at the amount of homes that were built, and so in 2008 there was such a shock, right? And because of that shock, builders, I shut down an entire company. We built homes in 2008, and that was the end of it. We phased out what we did, and recently I started one where we're starting to build some new homes in Oregon, actually. But um, after 2008, you just saw building drop substantially. We have yet in this market, we have never returned to the number of new homes constructed or new homes sold other than the blip in 2020 uh, during COVID. We've never returned to what it was in 2005, pre-2008. Mm. So, and yet our population has grown by 30 million people. So still low inventory. So we still have no homes. We're estimated to be missing around six and a half million if you believe realtor.com. And so missing about six and a half million homes. And that, that can be an apartment. It can be a ATU, a little small house in the backyard or a re regular house or condo or something. It can be anything, but we're missing 8 million. And then if you also look at population swings, they have changed quite a bit. Divorce rate is slightly higher, which means there are more homes for them. And then household formation has also been delayed by a lot. And household for formation <clears throat> is where I have more questions for you than you have for me. Because sure. <laughs> your generation is like, yeah, the one, yeah. like, what are you all thinking? Right? Because uh, many people in the next generation lived with their parents for a long time. COVID, of course, made sense to do it. Because you're like, well, this is nuts. I can't go outside. Might as well go check up with mom let, and dad. Stay let for a mom while. and dad cook for me and yeah, buy the groceries. Exactly. Yeah, That's what I did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Many did. So that's why when COVID phased out, it's like, man, we should go get our first home. I'm going to go, you know, finally get an apartment. I just need to get out. And all of that took off all at once. And there was a mass exodus out of cities into like anywhere. That was great. And of course, we saw what that did. That just drove up demand like crazy. And there was so much money in the market. Yeah. And so then you see that in real estate. So real estate won't have. And then the other thing that happened in 2008 is Bear Stearns was the start of the fall before it was like we came up with this turn like too big to fall right mm -hmm. um and when bear Stearns starts it they uh it was aig as well and so they were backing uh many commercial banks well this time the fall is slightly different because the fall is now in crypto right so you're seeing crypto being wiped out and the banks are like ah well we never invest in crypto because we weren't really allowed to so all the banks really just took part in the transaction. So they've made money on crypto. They don't have much to lose. And so there was around $30 billion invested in crypto um, just in the last three years. Mm -hmm. Most of that are retail investors mm -hmm. or VC, venture funds. And so venture funds are non-recourse. Let's be honest, they're rich people, right? Or they are retirement funds or something along those lines. And so many of them are getting wiped out, you know, due to what's going on. And many retail investors are getting wiped out, which is sad because I, I do imagine this will lead to people's retirement money. And that yeah. was foolish of them to put the retirement money in this. Um, but I imagine they did 
gamble with that because they were making so much money. Like in 2020, it was like, oh, yeah. Bitcoin's 15,000. All of a sudden it goes to 60,000. Like, it's this hard is, not to. It's genius. Exactly. Everybody was like, Bitcoin's the play. <laughs> I almost was like, maybe I'm wrong because I was definitely against Bitcoin as an asset. I like it as a, as a currency, but not an asset. And it could never figure out what it was. And so now that it's kind of coming down, I think there will be a huge adjustment, but most of it's going to be on the retail side. And unfortunately, we see a lot of money still. And then another sign that's happening right now is, uh, 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 what's the, uh, uh, I forget the fund, uh, Rock, uh, Black Rocks fund. Black Rock, yeah. Yeah, so they have a real estate fund and they just released that how many owners are requesting capital back. And so that that's a huge sign because what does that mean? It means, well, there's a couple of things going on. The, the way the Federal Reserve pulls money out of the economy is by paying for a bond more than it's worth. Right. And so who can resist when they're buying bonds at like nine and a half percent and you can only loan at seven? Forget it, I'm not loaning you money, I'm gonna buy some bonds. And so they suck money out of the economy this way. And so one, you could get you know a nice rate out of that. Um, but two, it could show that, you know, they pay too much and some of the returns are not coming back. And three, it could show that they just don't believe in it long term that something could happen. So they're wanting to pull funds back. Any of them are truth that there is a little bit of capital crunch happening. And so, mm. so that could be good. The question is how much of a capital crunch could impact it. And what, the thing you have to put out there is like, even though their real estate fund is really big and, you know, commercial buyers of single family rentals make up less than 5% of the whole market. <laughs> so there is a small little drop in the bucket of how much money is actually out there. And so even though they may take a turn, it won't. So in my own prediction, sadly, real estate's still going to keep going up. It's not going to take much of a hit. Uh, uh, and unemployment is probably going to stay pretty strong, <laughs> sadly. And uh, the real thing we uh, I wish we could do is get past this war. <laughs> this mm. war will make a huge change. One of the problems is the war for the U.S. means that they are paying anything to do with arms and security. Have some really good contracts going on right now. And all of those are American-based companies. And so that's only money back into our economy, which is then going to actually help with inflation. Mm -hmm. And so we do have a problem ahead of us. And so we keep going through a lot of debt. But And then... Go ahead. I was going to say, what do you do with all that? Right. So like we've got all these different factors, but do you have like your here's what I'm doing 2023, you know, given all these different inputs? So here here is what I'm literally doing in 2023 is I'm in real estate. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the markets I looked is if you really try to arbitrage states, I'm mm -hmm. just giving my own predictions here. Yes. I originated from Oregon, but I don't live there anymore. But I did find two states that were the same. And that is, uh, I did a paper on this, uh, I don't remember what month, six months ago or so, where the best place to arbitrage a sale would be Oregon, and the best place to then fully arbitrage it would be to buy it in Arkansas. Arkansas had the most inventory, Oregon had the least. Oregon only has 4 million people in it. California has 40 million. Right. And we are seeing baby boomers turn about 10,000 a day turn 65. Mm. So we have not really even come close to the impact. And this is why your generation really should be telling all of us what's going to happen here is because the parts that we know were, are playing out as predicted and they're pretty definitive. Like you're going to get older, so you eventually will retire. And so that's the part, you know, we don't know, but there aren't enough of you all there. There are a lot of you all, but there aren't enough of mine. Generation X has a big missing gap. And right. the question is, um, are you all going to totally fill that space manually? Or are you going to be like, we're going to leave it open or we're going to automate it? If you automate it, then it's possible to support all the baby boomers who are going to retirement. Mm -hmm. If you do it by services, then we will not have enough people. <laughs> we need to increase immigration in this country by like a lot in order to to make it because we just won't have enough people because we'll have a lot of people wanting supply but nobody able to provide it because we right. just don't. and and so the shortage in employment that we saw is just the start i mean mm. it will continue to take place so so for me i said 
Well, I real estate's a solid bet. Six and a half million homes are missing right now that have to be supplied. Where are those markets going to go first? Like I said, 10% of the population of California is in Oregon, and Oregon's about half the size. And so uh, we're doing developments now that we've we started just that last year. It's actually my kids' company. And okay. uh, they're doing, I think, 67 dwelling units or something all around there, kind of a retirement area. But that's what we're going after is saying like real estate's a, a great bet for the next decade to two decades. We're going to have another problem after that because population is about to decrease by a lot. Uh, however, uh, the next 20 years, there's we still got to have a roof over our heads. So. Yeah. So yeah, so so that's, people saying, that's right. hold your money, sit on the side, wait for the crash. Ooh, terrible, terrible yeah. idea. So, so the one thing you got to be careful of and keep in money, and this is a principle all the time. Currency is never an asset. Right. <laughs> like there are the Forex traders who will, who will they do different. That's fair enough if you're moving around currencies, but you got to be pretty savvy and quick to move around currencies. But currency is never an asset. It is a currency. You should only have currency when you're trying to get it to another asset. And so a lot of people, I've just heard so many people who have sold their house out of California and they're like, man, I sold it. And they, you know, had a million bucks now in their bank account. And they're like, ah, we're just going to, we're going to wait this out and buy it later. <laughs> it's like, and the longer they sit, they can't help themselves, but, you know, spend a little bit of it. Sure. So pretty soon now they can't even afford to live where they sold. Right. Um, they'll have, you know, they were renting for the short term, but now they'll have to rent for the long term. And, you know, unfortunately, all of them have only one choice, and that is to move to Oregon. But <laughs> <laughs> but they will have to move out of the city that they, you know, didn't want to now. And that same house has probably increased by $200,000 since they sold it. And so that's happening to many. So, yeah. So you're so. pretty high on Oregon, even given how high the prices are there already. And that's because of there's still such a lack of inventory. Such a lack of inventory. Oregon has one of the highest uh, uh, lack of, it's not a proper way to say that, but it has the, one of the biggest lacks of inventory in the right. country just because it's right next to a large state. So Washington, Idaho go up from there. Um, Wyoming and Colorado drop down a lot, but Colorado is, is right in there running. And so um, all of those used to be flyover states and kind of bypass states, but they're where I mean, I, I'm not saying this by opinion, but they're where baby boomers are deciding to go. Right. <laughs> so they're definitely flocking. It's not that they're all leaving California, but to impact a state of 4 million and a state of 2 million and a state of 5 million and a state of 400,000 doesn't take very many right. uh, to change right. those. And so if you look at Oregon real estate comparison, I mean, you know, pre COVID, you were going to sell your house you know, in, in LA or even, you know, higher, let's go into um, East Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. You're gonna sell your house for 5 million. And you know that now that's a $10 million home. And Oregon average house, you can now pick up for 450,000, which you know, you're like, <laughs> it's always been, you know, they sell their house and buy a neighborhood in Oregon. So that's still gonna be the case. They're going to Idaho, they're going to Colorado. So. So they are definitely moving across the states. Texas is faced with the exact same thing. It's just such a big state that you can actually see the migration within its own state. Right. And so people are leaving a lot of these metro areas and going out to a lot of these urban towns and cities and growing up. So El Paso and Lubbock are going to see a lot of growth. Uh, these are great places to live. So yeah. so yeah, there'll be lots of them in the exact same population push. I mean, Texas is you know right behind California with I think we're at something around 32 million now in population. Austin has just seen outrageous growth. And I'm one of those who's like, you know, 16 years ago, Austin was only 800,000 people. Mm -hmm. And that was like 2.4. Mm -hmm. And they really didn't really build that many roads. They really, like traffic is brutal now. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely like, I, I mean, I can't sell this house because if I did, I can't, I definitely can't live here anymore. Right. <laughs> So, so it's more of a decision like, well, how am I going to stay here? Where would I go next? And that's, that's Back everybody's Oregon? decision. Exactly. I don't know if I'd end up in Oregon. I mean, I, I think it is a great opportunity, but uh, after COVID and I don't know, they definitely had some, <laughs> I'm not ready to lock up that much. So, 
So yes, I don't know if I'll live in Oregon, but it's a beautiful place in the summer. But I do like uh, I do like my warm winters. Yeah. Well, you're from and Oklahoma, we, so you know you know kind of what I'm talking about. Yeah, we get a couple of days of snow, but nothing like so, you know some other places. Yeah. And I actually like, right? I went to high school in Dallas, so I know oh, nice. kind of the Texas area a bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, it's 75 today. That's what December six. Oh, it's it's six. colder than that here. I'm jealous. Oh. <laughs> it's a little humid today, but we're we're supposed to get. I think I, my daughter before she went to school, she's like, "Well, what's the weather?" It's like, "Well, I think we're at this for the next six days." So, okay, that's not too bad. Wednesday, so, so yeah, that's not too bad. We pay okay. for it in the summer, but yeah, yeah, you definitely do. I mean, goodness gracious, that's when you need to go to Oregon. Um, I'm curious with your your investments, you know, in Oregon and elsewhere. Are you partial to the single family, to small, large, multifamily? What are your thoughts mm. there? Uh, I mean, I, I can't say I'm I'm partial on either one. Um, I mean, it really is to someone's own taste. Single family rentals are extremely valuable right now. So um, I don't, I think they were, you know, definitely undervalued for a long time, but they have just a tremendous amount of value and they've become more appreciated over the last two years. And so I think what's great about them and I mean, one of the reasons I love them is because people live in homes. And so mm -hmm. a single family rental can also be your single family home in your residence. Mm -hmm. And one of the best advantages for someone like this is directly to you. Like if I were to advise you, like, how do you get into this? I wouldn't tell Please you do. to become a landlord first. I would mm -hmm. tell you to become a homeowner first. Yeah. And the reason is, is because we have this great tax advantage that you have every two years. So if you live in a house, for two of the past five years and you yep. sell it, uh, if you're married, you get a half a million. If you're single, you get $250,000 of gain free, no capital gains. Right. And that's so powerful, especially in the beginning when you're trying to grow value, you know, to, to be able to borrow money to do these. And that's so important in the beginning because you don't want to wait till the end that um, that's really where the heart of it is. Like that's the first one you should do. Like, yep. You know, do as much as you can, be as cheap as you can, get your own home, live in it for two years and sell it and take that gain and now split it. And whether you split it into a duplex where you live in one side and sell the other one, or you have your house and then you um, have a rental on the side, that's really the heart of it is, you know, grow it with, you know, value and collateral, you know, instead of very thinly growing it on debt. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, that's what I'm doing now. I, I live in a duplex, you know. Oh, I love it. Have one that's side the best. Yeah, got super, super low down payment, down payment assistance to kind of get into it. And then, of course, when I decide, if and when I decide to move and sell, got that tax-free gains. Exactly. What, what would you say after that, right? So, so I've got, you know, a dozen rental properties, uh, living here pretty much for free, tenants pay the the mortgage. And now my mind is, well, what's my next step? You know, what do I scale? Do yeah, exactly. And that's the name of the game is scale. And a lot of people have gotten into single family rentals and scalability, but I don't think, I think it is a large scale thing. I don't think it's smaller. So um, the way I had to do it, and I think it makes sense for many, is you're going to get into the 1031 market. I, I imagine you're familiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the 1031 market is where, you know, once you get like two or three of them, you're going to sell those and then move into kind of a multifamily and mm -hmm. the multifamilies have levels. Like if you're below 50 units, it's very hands-on property <laughs> above 50 units on a property. And it's a little better because you can give somebody free rent and they kind of will manage your plan. <laughs> That's a huge difference. Uh, Cause if you don't have that, it doesn't pencil otherwise. If you don't have that, it's a lot of work on your end to manage those. But those are definitely, there's lots of multifamilies to kind of step into. Like Austin is one. It's not so uh, common in Oregon. I didn't grow up with a lot of them, but they have lots of fourplexes here. Right. Um, and so that's a market you kind of go into fourplexes um, or you can, you know, get into where they sell a block of property where you have one property and it has three fourplexes on it. So those are nice ones to kind of step into because uh, multifamily, there's two ways to do multifamily in my own way. And I just, I wouldn't even say I advise people. I just say, this is how I've done it. And I liked it. So, and that is, uh, you do it yourself or you end up doing a partnership way. And the partnership way just is a lot more work. Interesting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's definitely bigger numbers and a lot of potential there. Uh, but it's, it's like running a startup, right? <clears throat> as soon as you take investors money, 
It's a different company. It's a yeah. different game. You're you're on the clock, and that's just different. And so, if you like it and you're growing something, and it is a side gig, you know, it should stay a side gig. But if you're ready to jump in full time, then that can definitely be one. But I think it's been a fan. It grows well enough on its own as a side gig, and so that's where I, my own is to say, you know, I I want to control it all. <laughs> Um, not because I'm power hungry, but because it's less stress. And I yeah. want to grow up from a point of collateral where I don't have a lot of stress. So I'd rather, that's why I say build up small coffer with owning a house. Well, exactly what you're doing is perfect. And then you kind of leverage that. And you, see, you have options now. So you have two out of five. So you could say, okay, I've been in here for two years. I have a lot of equity. I could take a loan against this because you get two out of the five. So yep. you could take a loan in this and then you could build a new one. So that becomes your rental. Now, the only problem is as soon as you move from it, it's like residence is your rental. So you only get the increase for the time that you lived in it, but that still works because you're probably most of your game just happened. Right. I don't know how long you've lived in it, but, uh, and then you, you just buy another COVID. one. I, uh, oh, I closed so this per- oh, before, man, before shutdowns. So you're yeah. per- it's so good. So yours is so good because your gain is going to be in the most impactful time. So if you built another one now and that become your residency, you could sell them both in another two years from now and still take both of those tax-free because it's two right. of the last five years that you have right lived then you get so, four in there exactly and so no, so you're really at, and that's the question is like wow well, do i do i do i bring in a partner and that's really what the difference is and bringing in a partner is like right now you're controlling your destiny you're like i know what it is i control like if i need to do this i'll do this like if I need to like, all right, move back in with a roommate or get a roommate to make this work because I didn't have a tenant pay, like you can do that. Once yeah. partners are involved, it's, it's a different game. It's very, it's much more professional. And so that's why I think, you know, only people who really want to have a professional life doing it should do yeah. that. <laughs> because especially coming from the startup and venture world, like it is very professional. It's raising money and managing people's money is a different game. So right. managing your own money yeah. is... You know, different. Yeah, I've, so. I've dipped my toe into it on a little bit of both sides in the sense of uh, doing it myself, you know, using my own money and and then going from there, even doing the work myself, kind of similar to how you started. And then one of the great things about having the YouTube channel and having the presence is, like you said, there's a lot of cash out there. And, you know, I, I get people every single day who want to provide cash for deals and, and invest and partner. And that's kind of where I'm at now is, the scalability and the the opportunity with some of the partnership funds um, is definitely appealing because you know this is my full time thing and and this is the the vision for the business um, and so kind of from there what I'm thinking is like do we go into development do we go into uh, you know taking some of these run down properties you know multi families and and fixing them up and refinancing in a couple of years that's kind of all the things that are swirling in my head so this this conversation is super helpful to me. Yeah, no, you're at an exciting time, so I have to yeah. watch. <laughs> there you go, because there is so much, there is so much money, and there is so much opportunity out there, and so many different ways to do it. So, yeah. and now we have so many new creations, like these, these uh, um, ADUs, uh, alternative dwelling yeah. units. Yeah, this whole market, the I Airbnb. Just got on the you heard phone with Stephen, the builder. So. We're doing one of those now. Yeah, it's cr- well. Those are going to be huge. And California made it because they have such a housing shortage. They right. you can't have a single family rental zoning now throughout the entire state and oregon did it and i know both of them have all these nuances loopholes you can get out of it but um so oregon and california now the first two states would be like no more single family rental properties so right that's going to be a a big market so Uh, i'm curious you have a ton of stuff going on you've got a ton of different businesses from the real estate to software and other things what what does your day-to-day look like like where do you put most of your time and energy oh man well, I get up at three every morning. Oh, come on. Every day. So <laughs> I do have a strange sleep cycle. I go to bed at 10, I get up at three. And then uh, the first two hours, I, I do it because it's totally quiet. So I will take anybody who has any help. Um, you know, I'll do that, but I try not to have any meetings. Mm-hmm. And I will spend at least 30 minutes reading about the markets. That's usually my, my newspaper time to figure out what's going on. And then I have 30 minutes where I spend on whatever I'm trying to learn over that period. So right now I'm trying to do Ukrainian language. So I spend 30 minutes practicing my Ukrainian language. And then, you know, for the next hour, I typically put aside like, okay, here's my list of my projects that I got to uh, complete that rolled over from yesterday. And I run down, you know, that stuff. And then I go back to bed around five. 
Okay. And then I sleep till about seven. Then I get up and I hang out with my kids before they go to school. I only have four, but only two、uh, living here now. And so, and now it's super hard to see them because、uh, Michaela is almost fifteen and Logan is seventeen. So they basically got a lot going on. They avoid me and they're doing soccer <laughs> and robotics and work. And so I, you have to fight to see them. But then I send them off. And then between everything, there's just you know you just schedule it out during the day of what's going on, and then you know you balance it. So really, the I I, tr- I I once upon a time I tried to be reactive, or I should say I tried to be proactive,、mm-hmm. and I'm falling more into the reactive, which is not good.、Uh, mm-hmm. That's just because there's so much going on right now. But、uh, with most of it is on the tenant cloud side that we're really developing, and we're. We're switched、uh, payment solutions, and we have this new reconciliation tool coming out. So there's been a lot that I hope levels off come、um, next year. We brought in, so this is where we brought in an investor. Okay.、Um, and you know, there's been lots of advantages to that, and some disadvantages to that.、Sure. So that's where it's much more professional now. It's a different、yeah. game, and so、uh, that's changed things a lot, and just how we manage that relationship. <laughs> Uh, they have some portfolio companies I wanted to, to use. We tried, it didn't work, and so、mm-hmm. now we're trying to play catch up. So, so at the moment, yeah, it's been reactive and chaos during the day. But I don't ever give up on my quiet, you know, kind of、uh, time to learn about something new and do things like that. But, that's but、yeah. awesome. I love so that. That's, that's pretty much it. I don't. You know, that's, I love. Yeah,、that. I wish I had some secret, but、uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm barely making it. Is basically. Well, I mean, I mean, that kind of does sound like the secret is that you've got the things that you're protecting, right, and that are most important to kind of move the needle for you. So I really like that.、Um, my final question for you, and this is something I'm going to start asking every single guest, is if there's anything looking back in your journey, be it on the tech side, business side, real estate side, that you had to do differently, what would you change? Oh man. I don't know. I think I've had to justify everything I've done so much. I'd hate to go back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>、um, you know, I I worked for a venture capital fund for a short time, and I helped them grow. So when I started Tina Cloud, I also started this nonprofit. This is probably the only time I've said this publicly, but.、Okay. Um, But I started a nonprofit at the same time, and it's been amazing. It's for clean energy in Texas. It'll be the biggest. It's they've done. I can't remember how many billions now in refinancing. It's all around properties. It helps lets the property be the tax holder, so they can do long term improvements. We can go into commercial properties and why they have that on a separate note. But when I started that, there was a venture fund that I worked with. That、uh, sort of abused my relationship <laughs> lightly. And I sort of allowed it because I was new to the fund, and I kind of took it. But I've never—that's never sat well with me.、Mm. <laughs> it crossed my ethical boundaries,、mm. and uh,、um, just because what they were supporting was called、um, an SBIC,、mm-hmm. and I don't support those. I've openly not supported those, which are nuanced in the venture capital world. It's government money from insurance companies. And they used my name to kind of get into the governor's office, which I was with、uh, Governor Perry for a while, and knew, ran for office, knew lots of stuff in legislature. So, so I don't know if that's a good answer, but that one is definitely. I wish I could take back and basically、yeah. stand up and say, no, I don't support this in any way, shape, or form. And at the time, they did it, and I did like I don't know how to sit well. So yeah. So I don't know. I guess the one、that's、takeaway、really、is、answer. to just be confident in yourself because that's what I didn't have. As I was stepping into venture, it was new. I had actually done a lot of stuff, but I just was new to the venture capital industry itself as actually being one. And that's where I was. I don't know. I didn't.、Uh, I didn't feel well, but it never set well with me. In fact, I ended up leaving them、uh, about a year after that. On I tried to leave on. All positive terms, but that's the one thing that just never sat with me. I forfeited all my carried interest in all, and I, I never wanted to do anything with them, basically. And that's what really was the reason. So yeah, that's a big. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I guess it's have courage and stand up for whatever you think is right. Because if you don't, you end up regretting it for a long time, and you can't really go back. So right. So, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that, and kind of all the answers and and insights you've given. This has been a super fun conversation for me, so I appreciate it. And then, do just want to give you a chance if there's anything you want to ask me,、uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm open to hearing it. <laughs> well, you already gave me some hints because I am interested in where you're going. Because um, as I, I'm almost interested in like your entire generation. Because yeah. <laughs> you're definitely doing more than my kids are. So I can't <laughs> ask them. Uh, but you've already gotten into a duplex now, right? Mm -hmm. And you locked that in with a mortgage before. And so now you're thinking of on taking on a partner or going somewhere else. And I don't want you to have to expose yourself to any partners or anything you're in conversation with right now. Sure. But where are you leaning? Are you leaning like, I want to build this as, you know, my real estate thing? Or do you want to build this as, I want to build a real estate empire that's, you know, bigger than myself? Sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so far, in order to acquire rentals, I've been doing kind of the burr or renovate and refinance strategy, and I've only taken on equity to do that. Um, so nice. maintaining 100% ownership, and that's been great. Moved out of doing the work myself and started getting good enough deals to, you know, work with professional contractors and kind of step out of it using Tenant Cloud to manage the properties once we've got renters in it. And that's something that I, I think we could continue to do very easily um, and kind of scale more slowly. Uh, like I said, we're at about a dozen units in about a year and a half. Oh, that's awesome. You know, so, so it's been great. And documenting that process through social media has really been one of the biggest keys to my success because things haven't always gone well. I've done things right. I've done things wrong, but it's been such a networking tool for people in my own market, but also for equity invest or for uh, debt investors. Now, the next stage is, I think we're actually leaning towards doing a little bit more of equity partnerships and, and going big. Um, and that's a scary thing, right? It's like, it's not yeah. something that I've gone into before and I could kind of just stay safe, but part of me wants to go big. And also because I am documenting everything on social media, that feels like the better story to tell. Yeah. Um, Maybe that will be my downfall. Maybe that will be what <laughs> skyrockets me to success. But I think that's that's what I'm leaning towards. And I've, I've actually got a call tomorrow with a a uh, a tech investor who just had a big exit and is is looking to get into real estate space. And so, yeah, it should be should be an interesting story either way. But that's kind of where I'm leaning. That's fun. I love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited about your generation. I wish I met more like you because sometimes I, well, oftentimes I don't. <laughs> well, I appreciate <laughs> it. And I'm yeah. definitely going to uh, continue to, to talk about Tenant Cloud and my experience, experience with it. We've had a great experience so far. And also just like read and learn from all the things that you're putting out there. So I really do appreciate it. Love it. No, thank you. So I'm um, definitely impressed. I'll have to keep my eye on you. Uh, awesome. Yes, exciting well, let's, times. Yeah, yeah, let's stay in touch. And again, thanks for, for coming on the podcast. We'll Sounds shoot you all the information when the episode comes out and awesome. uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome. Same. Talk to you later. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys so much for watching. Yes, I forgot to record an outro, but I'll get it next time. If you made it to this part in the video, please comment the donut emoji so I know that you're a real one. And you'll see some links on screen to check out more content from myself.